Why do you write the books that you write? Well, that's certainly not a question anyone's ever asked me before, but I'll endeavor to answer it. Because you ask any writer, why do they write? That's the real question. Mm -hmm. Why we write the books we write, but why do you write? And a true writer's answer is going to be because they don't have a choice. They have to sit down and get these things out of their head. They have to create. They have to express. They have to vent. They have to analyze. They have to dig through their psyche, find out why the things that they think about are bothering them, why they're imagining certain scenarios, certain types of characters, and translate that wonder and curiosity into a story. It's not really mystical, but it's very hard to understand. I don't know that anyone really comprehends it. It's a lot of work. Uh, it doesn't really give you a whole lot of reward, and t except for a very short period of time, a brief window when you're done and you breathe a sigh of relief. But we still need to do it. I think writers just have this innate, inborn, perhaps genetic, but certainly deep-seated need to sit down and construct stories on the printed page. Do you have an inner editor who works with an outer editor? Do you? Well, certainly uh, you have to uh, filter yeah. a lot of uh, what you're writing as you're writing it, or it's going to be a monumental task later on if you don't. So the first editing process comes uh, as you're writing. Uh, the second editing process comes as you're reviewing what you've just written. And then the real work starts when you've actually gotten the uh, first draft done. Because writing is work. Mm. Writing is really two things. It's work and habit. You have to look at both those aspects of it realistically when you decide you want to be a writer and make sure that you uh, endeavor to to make them part of your lifestyle. Work in that you have to really sit and think and struggle through to get the, the proper sentences, paragraphs, scenes uh, in the right framework, in the right uh, tone, it, it, with just the right uh, degree of, uh, of detail and, um, and tension. But work is not the whole story. Uh, you c a lot of writers will sit and work for an entire weekend from dusk till dawn uh, and then go a week or two without writing and then get another two or three days in. That's not going to cut it. That's a lot of work, but you're not going to really make it as a writer, I don't think, that way because you don't have the habit. You have to be able to write every day. There can be times you go spurts without writing, but you have to be disciplined while you're on a project and write every day, or it's going to get away from you. You're going to lose your momentum. Inertia will set in both ways. If you're writing every day, you'll you'll be able to ride that inertia wave and keep writing. If you stop, if you take a break for three or four days from it, you're going to lose that. And inertia sets in the other way. It's hard to get it going again because your mind loses grasp of the finer points of your story, the finer points of your character detail. Even though it's your story, you understand the overall big picture of it. Uh, you're not going to be as intimate with what you're writing at the moment if you take that time off. Your your brain just can't, I don't think, can function that way uh, efficiently. So does that mean your sto your characters have backstories? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, you, you know, Hemingway uh, famously said that, uh, you know, a character it, it needs to be presented like an iceberg. You see the tip of the iceberg, but seven-eighths of an iceberg is beneath the surface. Yet when you see the tip of an iceberg out in the ocean, you sense its mass. Mm -hmm. You know it's there. Uh, for no other reason than just the way that tip is presented uh, has that mass beneath it. And there's just something about, you know, the visual of it that makes you understand there's a big, big, big piece you're not seeing. Well, a character is the same way. Um, you only present that tip of the iceberg, but that mass has to be there. And if it's ill-defined, inchoate, or poorly understood, or non-existent, heaven forbid, the reader's going to know that. They, they're going to sense something's missing. It's going to seem superficial, fake, plastic. It's not going to seem real. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your latest book. Uh, the last novel uh, just came out a couple months ago. It's called Diabolical. It's the sequel to my first novel, Damnable. As the same main character, a former Special Forces interrogator named Jake Hatcher. I uh, met him first in Damnable, where he was uh, disgraced, uh, serving a prison sentence, and released early temporarily to attend the, brother, the funeral of a brother he never knew he had. And uh, from there, he gets drawn into a, a very large and far-reaching conspiracy involving demons and uh, inhuman, immortal demon hybrids 
females known as carnates and uh, psychopathic billionaire uh, all coming together, uh, hell-bent, no pun intended, on uh, ending the reign of heaven. And uh, I ended Damnable with uh, Hatcher uh, having... Uh, survived but i won't go into detail exactly uh you know how he managed that uh, diabolical picks up sometime after that where he's decided to change venue and get away from things but uh, things have a way of uh, of tracking him down and uh, he's again faced with uh, another similar i would like to think uh, you know even more pressing type of uh, of a situation uh where he has to put all his uh, hard edge skills and uh, metal to, to the test. Mm. Well, there's two already out. Is there a third in the works? Uh, I'm thinking about it. Not sure yet. Um, you, you don't, as a writer, you have uh, often a lot of different uh, ideas for novels. You don't have the time to do them all. Um, if there's demand for uh, a third uh, installment, I'd be happy to write one. Uh, at the moment, I'm working on another thriller that's unrelated. Uh, but I, uh, Jake Hatcher's irrepressible. I think he'll be back. Right. So you won the Bram Stoker Award. How how's that working out for you? Oh, that's great. Uh, yeah, I was very honored. Um, the Bram Stoker Award is given out by the uh, Horror Writers Association. Mm -hmm. um, my first novel, Damnable, won for a superior achievement in a first novel. It's very prestigious. Uh, I was very gratified. Um, it's uh, it's an absolute honor uh, to name the the great horror authors in the past who've won it you know would be a who's who of course Stephen King you know, um, is a perennial nominee uh, the year before I won for first novel Joe Hill Stephen King's son won for um, Heart Shaped Box it's a very prestigious award I was uh, very honored to be a recipient let me ask you one more question too while I got you on here um, what do you how do you feel about ebooks and and uh, have you turned your books into that yet your series well, uh, the publisher certainly offered Damnable and Diabolical both as ebooks uh, yeah. for the Kindle, for uh, the Nook, and for the various other formats that are out there. Uh, ebooks are here to stay. Uh, it's certainly the talk of the publishing industry, and uh, writers at every convention uh, mm -hmm. speak of little else these days. Um, it's taking shape as we speak, and no one is really certain what the future holds. Uh, I don't think the printed page on paper is going to disappear. Uh, but this isn't a fad. This is a, a technological revolution um, that is changing the uh, delivery mechanism you know, for fiction and nonfiction. Uh, it's very convenient to have a Kindle and be able, or a Nook, or any of the others, to be able to wirelessly download your book instantly that you're interested in. Um, theoretically, it should save a lot of money, and those costs should be passed along to the readers out there. Um, the publishing industry, unfortunately, uh, but understandably, was uh, erected around an entirely different model. So they're struggling to uh, adjust to this brave new world that they're facing. Uh, it's not going to be simple. They're going to be pains. Uh, people don't want to pay for Manhattan offices for large publishers uh, to have large staffs. Uh, when they're not getting any physical product, they're getting a computer file. Mm. They think that should mean big savings to them, and the publishing houses are saying, whoa, 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 we've got to pay not just the author, but, you know, my salary as editor, you know, my secretary, um, the various uh, copy editors and, and uh, staff artists and and uh, people like that. You know, that's that's a very, very big percentage of the cost of a book. The problem for publishing houses is for many, many years they talked about the physical costs of publishing a book and played those up uh, when now they're trying to back off of that and say, no, that's a relatively small percentage. So, um, you know, a little pants on fire action going on here for them. Uh, but I do sympathize because mm -hmm. uh, it is a difficult situation for them to be in when uh, we're decentralizing um, the means of production here mm -hmm. uh, because of the technological innovations uh, and advancements that have allowed it. And when you uh, decentralize something like that, a centralized industry that's located primarily in Manhattan in this case, uh, very expensive leases, very expensive real estate, uh, they're, they're really going to struggle. It's going to be hard. Uh, and the victims aren't always the people who deserve to be victims. Uh, authors uh, have a lot of autonomy now if they're a name brand. 
mid-list authors, they have to decide, you know, are they going to try to go it on their own and self-publish these e-books? Or are they going to try to stick with the um, the pedigree of a major publishing house who uh, may be taking some of their economic frustrations out on their mid-list authors? So uh, it's, it's hard to say where it's going to go. Uh, people are still, as writers, making uh, a lot of money uh, taking advantage of this new ebook market out there. Uh, the price point that uh, a lot of authors are able to offer self-published books at is very attractive to a lot of readers, and a lot of authors have made a lar- have constructed or, or um, uh, put together a very impressive following just because they've offered a decent book uh, or a decent series of books at a decent price. Mm-hmm. People like paying two ninety nine for a book instead of twelve ninety nine. They like that. Uh, how long that's going to last? How long? How much of that is a novelty? I don't know. Uh, it's lasted longer than I thought it was going to last. To be honest, um, we haven't yet seen the end of people who are coming out with their own books, self-publishing them, and making a lot of money. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that name brand authors are able to take advantage of that. Mm. It surprises me the number of unknown authors that have been able to uh, figure out ways to tap into that market. But that's the challenge. Um, without a bookstore, without that book being on the shelf in front of readers who are going there specifically to look for books, it's hard to get heard above the din. That's right. It's How do you get, get that attention? Noticed. People, some people are figuring it out. Yeah. Um, some of it's luck. <laughs> uh, some of it is uh, really savvy marketing skills. Um, some of it is just the cream rising to the top, I'm sure. Uh you know, it's certainly something I'm thinking about. Uh, I don't think there's an author out there who isn't <laughs> contemplating it. Uh, but the question is, you know, do you do you cut bait and, and go to a different spot to fish? Or do you try to continue with the proven and, um, you know, more prestigious route, I would say, of uh, sticking with a major publishing house? It's not an easy question to answer. But just like yours isn't an easy question to answer when you say, what do you think about it? I think a lot of things. I've only scratched the surface here. <laughs> And where can people get them? Are they in regular bookstores? They, they, uh, Amazon? Cer- certainly, you know, Barnes & Noble, Borders is gone, but they carry the books okay. a million. Uh, all those stores carry them. Uh, the shelf life of uh, novels today is not that long. If you have <laughs> trouble finding them at your bookstore, they're certainly available on Amazon. And any bookstore, of course, order it. Absolutely fabulous. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you.